All right, everyone. Why don't we uh, why don't we get started? Um, first off, I want to welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Lunny, um, the new executive director here at the Scholastic League. Only a couple of days in, um, and uh, I, I want to thank first of all before we do anything. I want to thank everyone for their patience and understanding. Uh, over these past few months as we continue to navigate through these difficult times. Um, over the past summer, uh, we've been very busy in, the, in this office uh, collaborating with our member schools, superintendents, our principals, our athletic directors, um, our sport committees, the governor's task force, the National Federation of High Schools, all of our fellow state associations, and the departments of health and education and planning for this upcoming school year. Um, due to the constantly changing landscape of this worldwide pandemic, we've been very careful not to get out in front of the governor's guidance and the enormous task facing our schools in reopening for education. As we move forward, we want to stress the importance of only relying on information directly communicated from this office regarding any changes or updates to the school sports seasons. Although there's still tremendous uncertainty about what school will look like this fall and what phase Rhode Island will be in, this update is meant to provide a framework regarding how high school sport decisions will be made moving forward. It's our intent to plan for the maximum amount of participation opportunities in the fall that are safe and appropriate while recognizing the challenges that are facing the reopening of schools for education. So with that said, and I think everyone has this, we just have this short PowerPoint presentation that we wanna kind of highlight and go through. And certainly at, at the end, we'll, we'll entertain any questions that you, you may have once we're, once we're done. One second, I just gotta share my screen. I hope everybody can see that. Um, okay, this first slide I've already alluded to all the people that we've been collaborating with. Um, but mainly what I also wanna say is that, that the, the Interscholastic League and the Principals Committee on Athletics, which is our governing body, um, obviously we all recognize the, the educational value and benefits that high school sports provides to the more than 36,000 student athletes that compete in our league annually. Um, with a focus on students' mental health, Social and emotional well-being, research has shown the benefits of exercise, social interaction, and sense of belonging. So it's obviously part of our mission that we want to provide those opportunities moving forward. So the plan that we're going to talk about today, I want to emphasize um, that no decisions at this point have been made on any fall sports. Um, that, the, the, that this plan is going to be fluid and that the health metrics and data that's going to be driven from the Brown Department of Health is going to is going to continue to be closely monitored as we as we uh, continue to make our decisions, as well as the, the feedback that we're going to be getting from our member schools. Um, as you could even see in the governor's press conference this afternoon, um, guidance and restrictions can change at any time, and we've got to be able to adjust um, to all those situations. Uh, we're going to continue to consult with all of our stakeholders, with the governor's task force, uh, who have been very cooperative so far. Uh, in all of our member schools to make sure that, that we can provide as many opportunities for kids as possible. Um, this next slide just kind of highlights, and I think everybody's got this, but kind of highlights a lot of the challenges that our schools are going to face in, in providing their athletic programs this year. So we're, we're working with them uh, on models and, and examples of how we can help to do that in a better way um, this year. It's certainly going to look different. Um, but one of the highlighted things here is, is transportation and school budgets are obviously going to be things that we're going to have to worry about, as well as the most important thing, which is going to be the management of any potential virus spikes, outbreaks, or quarantines. Um, and we've been working with the National Federation of High Schools, their National Sports Medicine Advisory Committee, um, on rules modifications that we can, we can adapt to our, our sports programs to, to hopefully minimize and mitigate the risk of spreading the virus. Um, a big part of what we've been doing and what we're going to continue to be doing is the education of, of our administrators, coaches, and staff, because again, things are going to be very different this year, um, and, and health and safety are going to be the main priority. 
Um, spectators, when it comes to regular season events, when, when athletics start, um, a, a lot of that's going to be driven by the guidance that is going to be put out by our governor um, as far as gathering sizes and then local decisions that are going to be made at the schools level. Um, what we want to announce today is, is that our Principals Committee on Athletics has voted um, to move the start date of fall sports from August 17th to September 14th. And, and the rationale behind that vote um, was mainly for uh, our schools to be able to make sure that our schools were able to get open and running before we were going to put athletics into the equation. So that's something, again, based on the feedback that we've gotten from our our schools and, and the work that we've been doing this summer, um, we feel it's a prudent move to delay the start of, of, the, of the sports season until September 14th at, at this point. Um, what we're gonna do because of that is, is we're gonna extend our, our summer coaches contact period um, through August 31st. Um, so that right now with school approval and within the guidance that's been put out by the governor for phase three, um, our, our high school coaches, um, just based on our rules, are allowed to have contact with, with their kids um, within those guidelines. So we're going to extend that period through August 31st. Um, if we're able to start on September 14th, our regular acclimatization period for all of our sports is going to start, uh, and games would not begin until Friday, October 2nd, with scrimmages and injury fund contests allowed to, to start a few days earlier that week. Postseason tournaments um, are going to be administered again by the RIL like they are every year and adjusted accordingly. And again, no specifics on these things at this point, um, but again, those are, those are how those decisions will be made. It will be coming from our office through our support committees um, and obviously the principals committee on athletics. Um, due to the transportation issues that our school is going to be facing, you know, again, we're going to we're going to recommend utilizing weekends for gameplay. Um, to try to minimize the amount of transportation and buses that are going to have to be available um, for schools. That does not mean that all games will be on, on the weekend. And so I want to emphasize that uh, if schools have the ability uh, and mutually agree that if they can get a game in during the week, that's certainly going to be um, up to them. But, but again, we're going to try to um, uh, reschedule our fall events accordingly and, and try, to, try to maximize participation on the weekend. As I talked about before, I mean, there's a number of sport rule modifications that have come out from the National Federation of High Schools that, that we're gonna be instituting um, with all of our sports and, and we're gonna be working with our sport committees, with our officials, um, groups, uh, to make sure that we can make things as safe as possible. Um, a lot of that guidance is on the, on the page, that link that's on that page um, on this slide that you can, you can certainly look through. Um, as we move through the process and as we look to um, start sports, we could certainly be adding more restrictions, more safety guidelines to, to those equations to try to, again, make things as safe as possible for everyone. Um, as we talked about, we're going to be encouraging um, all of our coaches, our athletic directors, our staffs um, to take it, the National Federation online course, which is called COVID-19 for Coaches and Administrators. Uh, it's a great course put out on NFHS Learn. Um, which is, is going to allow our coaches to, to get a, a good background, much like they, they take uh, concussion courses and, and other courses that we mandate. Um, we're going to utilize that as a learning tool um, as people prepare for the season. Um, each school right now, when they're talking about the reopening of education, has got to go through uh, plans to institute for, for checking symptoms if, for in, any in-school learning. So again, the athletic programs are going to have to be connected with that. And, um, and we're gonna work with them to make sure that all those, all those safety procedures are put in place before we start any kind of uh, sport participation. And again, th throughout the rest of the summer, we're gonna continue guidance and support for our schools in many different ways, through coaches meetings, through education, um, and other media platforms. Um, you know, again, we're, we're, this is a fluid thing. Um, we, we have been very happy with the, with the collaboration that we've been able to have through, with our superintendents, with our principals, with all of our stakeholders that, that have the best interests of our students in mind. So 
Um, you know, we're confident that we're going to be able to provide a, a great um, experience for our kids this year. And, and, and again, be ready to adjust to whatever happens as we, as we go. So as far as a, a return to athletics model, um, you know, we can only go by where we are as of this day. Okay, and again, no decision, I want to emphasize again, there's no decisions have been made on any fall sports at this point, as far as what we're going to be offering. Um, but as of today, the phase three guidelines put out by the governor um, would only allow team competition as far as the sports that we offer in boys cross country, girls cross country, girls tennis, and game day cheer, which is sideline cheer. It's not competitive cheer. Um, so if the season were to start today, these are the only sports that we would currently be able to offer. So all other fall sports at this point would not be allowed for, uh, for team competition at this point. So what's our goal? Our, our goal and our intention um, as it is every year, is to provide every student athlete the opportunity to participate in their chosen sport during this school year. Um, obviously, with all the challenges that we're facing, it's not going to look traditional, um, but we're going to do everything in our, in our power to provide those offerings to our schools, um, and most importantly, to each student athlete. Um, so the goal of, of, of this, again, is the framework that we're trying to put in place that's going to be flexible. Um, so that as we go, we can make decisions um, that are in the best interest of everyone with the goal in mind of providing every student with the opportunity to participate in their sport. So as far as the calendar is concerned, um, again, if all fall sports um, or, or if all fall sports were able to go, then we would not need this model. Um, but as of right now, um, if there is any, any offering in the fall that we cannot provide, um, we are going to be looking to go to this model here, which is really becomes a four season model. So uh, what we would try to do is, is uh, provide all fall sports that are within the governor's guidelines um, to begin on September 14th. And that would be our season one. Our season two would be our traditional winter sports with the start date to be determined. Again, as we go, we're going to make decisions based on where we're, where we're at in the process. Uh, season three would be any fall sports that we're not able to begin on September 14th. And then a season four, uh, our traditional spring sports. Okay. So at this point, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hey, Mike, it's Will Gagan. How are you? I will. Uh, so sort of a, a general question, you know, in the spring, the, the principal's committee said, you know, part of the reason for the cancellation was that if school wasn't, you know, in-person classes weren't happening, then there, there wouldn't be sports. What's the situation with that sort of concept now? Well, back in the spring, you know, I think things were, even though there was a very disappointing decision that we had to make on, on behalf of our kids, um, the decisions that were made back in the spring were a lot easier to make because it kind of affected every single kid across the country and every state. Um, and, and even though education continued, um, sports were not allowed. Um, at this point, the difference is that, that sports are allowed at this point. Uh, based on the governor's guidance. So again, the, the ultimate decision will be will rest with our with our member schools, and and what on uh, what sports they would support. But um, but what we're trying to do is put together a plan um, that can fit any model that's out there um, as far as education. So if it's if it's in in person learning completely, um, this model will fit. If it's if it's uh, hybrid, this model would fit. And if it's total distance learning, then then also that would fit. But again, you know, those decisions will be made by our schools, not by, not by us. Thanks, Mike. There's some there's some colleges um, conferences out there that have already come out and, and have canceled fall sports altogether. Um, I guess 
you know, why kind of, you know, jump through the hurdles now with this plan as opposed to maybe following, you know, their lead and just saying, hey, let's kind of just push fall sports back to the spring, you know, just to, to play it safe. Yeah, great question. Um, and, and I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, the colleges, a lot of the colleges have canceled. And, and although we are monitoring all those situations, um, and I think you can, you can tell by the conversations that are going on across the country when it comes to high school sports, is that it's, it's really a different animal at the high school level because we can, we can do things more regionally and, and, uh, and we can control and manage things a little bit better than a college with as far as travel concerns and considerations that they have to deal with. So although you know, we're certainly monitoring those things and having conversations at that level, um, you know, we're focusing on, on how, it, how it could impact uh, kids at our level. Hey, Mike. Yep. All right, Joe, get out of here. Uh, I had a, a couple questions, just to follow up. So say there is uh, just virtual learning. Um, you guys would still try to do um, sports somehow? That again, those would be those would be questions. Yes, that we would we would try to put a model together for our schools to, to offer to our schools. Um, but again, those those are things we're going to work through with them as far as what what school is learning. I think one of the things I want to make sure I emphasize is that is that to date, our schools really don't know what school is going to look like yet. I mean, they've they've submitted all their plans, um, but they haven't heard back on exactly what it's going to look like, and it could look differently across our state. Um, it's not going to be one cookie cutter approach to the educational model. So we're part of schools and we're part of education. So I think what we want to say is that is that um, once schools know what school looks like, I think they're going to look at that and say, okay, now how can athletics be a part of that that equation? In a follow up, you mentioned um, that all the coaches are going to go through like protocols and stuff. Will there be any testing for student athletes on a regular basis or for the beginning of the season, or how will that work? We're not ready to release that yet, Joe, but, um, but those are the things that we're working on right now. And, and again, all of these things kind of lead to, to all the decision making that we're, we're getting moving forward. But at a minimum, at a minimum, there would have to be symptom checking every day. And finally, you mentioned, um, obviously, you guys are probably working very closely with the governor's office. Is this one of those things where it's just based on her guidance at that specific time when you guys are ready to go on that, at that date? Well, over the past couple of weeks, we've been really uh, trying to get feedback from our from our superintendents, our schools, as to where they're at. Um, and we're also providing information to the governor's office, to the governor's uh, task force, um, with regards to, you know, the sport rule modifications that, that we can uh, use to make things safer. So, again, not being able to know exactly where we're going to be in a month, um, we're just trying to position ourselves to try to put plans together that can make things as safe as possible and then work with the governor's office to see if they will work within those guidelines. So that's kind of where we are in the process right now. We've been very happy with the, the, the way that, um, that we've been collaborating where they're, they're taking our input and our feedback um, and using that within our planning. But I, I want to emphasize that we are, uh, our schools have, have told us loud and clear that, that we are committed to following the governor's guidance um, and recommendations moving forward. Thank you, Mike. Hey, Mike. Hey, just oh, go ahead, Brandon. Hey, Mike. It's uh, Brandon. Just um, did the league give any consideration of maybe switching around sports, like moving baseball, softball, sports that that are being played at the youth level right now to the fall, and putting just putting the higher risk sports like football and soccer to the spring? Yeah, I, I, that's a good question, Brandon. And yes, uh, we have. So, I mean, yes, could we? Could we move spring sports to, to the fall because they fit within the guidance as they are right now? Yeah, we could. But again, we don't know where we're going to be in, in, in a month, number one. And we have to put, uh, there's a, lot, a tremendous amount of planning that has to be put into place for, for everything. So it's our goal to, to provide as many traditional fall sports as we can in the fall. Um, but I think the most important reason why we're not looking at that model right now is because that would automatically uh, put kids in a position where they may have to choose between um, sports that they play in a particular season. So taking spring sports and moving them to the fall, um, you know, they're, they're, there's probably kids that play baseball that run cross country or girls that play softball and play tennis. Um, so we wanna, we, again, we wanna try to give every kid their opportunity to participate in their sport 
during this season. So from a planning perspective and, and for kids not having to choose, um, we want to do as many fall sports as we can within the guidelines. And just to follow up, has there any been any thought about maybe extending the summer training period? I know it, it, it's right now to August 31st, but closer to the September 14th date, or is it better to give a little bit of a break before going on to the next step? Yeah, that uh, we, we purposely didn't put that, that information in there because basically our summer has been extended to August 31st versus August 17th, which is the traditional start of fall sports. So we're just allowing that activity to go on to, to the first day of school, as, as it's stated at this point. Okay, Then we're going to revisit that period between September 1st and September 14th. And, you know, again, we can potentially be looking at models where we allow or relax some of our out-of-season coaching rules, uh, depending on where we're at. Um, but again, we don't have any specific guidance on that, so we didn't include that in the plan at this point. Mike, just to clarify about the games when they can happen. So you guys are encouraging the weekend, but that's not mandatory. So there still can be games played during the week. Right. These are, this is just guidance because, again, the, the schools administer regular season events on their own. Um, we don't schedule them. We give them a schedule, but then they, they, they move them around based on their own needs, their, their own facilities and whatever else is going on. So, again, if, if there's two schools, let's say they're, they're next to each other. Um, and they have an ability or they have lights where they can get um, get to a game later on where there's a bus available, then we're certainly not going to discourage that because we want to maximize our participation. But from what we've been hearing about the challenges that the schools are going to have with transportation, um, we felt that putting, putting together this model would be the best way for a recommendation to go forward for them to kind of uh, wrap their head around their planning. Mike, um, it came out about the two student athletes from Westerly. Uh, are those the only two so far with the summer conditioning programs of the football um, that have tested positive? And is that a concern to you guys, obviously? Absolutely. And that's, that goes to the ever changing landscape that we're dealing with. So um, yeah, to our knowledge, those are, those are the only two that we've seen out there. Uh, but, but obviously there's a lot of other youth sports going on out, out there in the state as well. So, um, uh, you know, we don't have all that information at this point, but we'll certainly be using that as part of our plan and moving forward. Hey Mike, it's uh, with with it all these decisions being made to see like this by the schools. If if a student is to opt out from in in classroom learning, would that make that would they still be eligible to play sports? Um, again, those would be those would be individual school decisions um, by our rules. I mean, we have homeschooled uh, kids. We have rules that center around homeschooled kids um, that allow participation opportunities there. So. Our principal co committee could certainly look at uh, making a, a rule change in that, but from uh, my perspective at this point, those would all be local school decisions. And uh, is there a plan in place if an athlete does test positive in season? Would that be what? What would the protocol be for that? Would Would that be the end of the season for the kid? Would that be the end of it for the team? It, well, just like they would be during school time, if uh, if there was a test positive. Um, there would be an isolation, obviously, situation that would go on. And then and at that point, the Department of Health and the CDC guidelines would kick in, and, and our schools would be mandated to follow those things. Um, but obviously, a kid would not be uh, cleared to return to play until, until all of those hurdles are, are, are reached. Matt, this is uh, Keith Cumberland at the Wesley Sun. Is September 14th the latest that the Part 2 sports could uh, – start if for example the governor said we're going to phase four september 24th or september 28th could those part two sports start that late or is september 14th the latest that they could start and get in the season and everything you want to accomplish yeah keith that's it's, it'd be hard to determine that at this point um so again we're, we're basing our plans based on what's in front of us right now um i know that that happened in massachusetts um where you know they put a plan to delay the start of fall sports and then and then school um, ended up uh, starting later. So again, those are, those are all things that we'll have to work through um, with our schools as we go, um, and then we'll cross that bridge when we when we get there. Mike, I know there's over you know thirty thousand student athletes that participate in the RIIL. What would be your message to them, since you probably can't see them face to face or really have a chance to kind of talk to all of them, you know, as you guys work through these plans and keep their best interest in mind. 
Thank you, Maury. I, that's a, that is, what I would say to them is, is that, um, you know, we're doing everything in our power uh, to give them those opportunities that only come around once in a lifetime for kids. And some of those decisions that we had to make back in the spring and even at the end of the winter were so difficult because we knew what the impact would be. Um, I think it softened the blow again because it happened across the country and everybody was was in the same boat. I think there was a little bit of solace there. Um, but that's what makes this whole situation a little bit different, different this year is that as you're looking across the country, everyone's treating this differently. And depending on what's going on in each state, depending on uh, the governor's guidelines in each state, um, everyone's trying to make the best decisions that they can, which is going to lead to some inconsistencies out there. So I think what we're trying to do is even though we're trying to stay connected with everybody uh, across the country, we're trying to make the best decisions we can for our state within the situation that we're in. Um, but I just want those kids to know um, how important it is for them. And we're going to do everything we can to make that happen. Thank you. So, Mike, when you're talking about um, scheduling and coming up with ideas for a reduced season for some of these sports, is it more about regionalizing it rather than, you know, Division One, Division Two, that sort of thing to minimize the travel and to make it, you know, more feasible to have games in, in certain areas of the state? I think that I think that that's one of the things that uh, – that this is where athletic directors are really going to come into play. And, and I got to give them so much credit uh, for the job that they do behind the scenes to, to get things ready. Um, you know, they want to plan, they're planners. And so through some of the conversations that we've had, um, you know, once we can get some real um, more definitive direction, we're going to try to do some pre-planning with them as far as um, how we're going to handle those things. How are we going to handle uh, sub varsity sports? How are we going to handle, um, those regional type competitions, um, you know, it's not going to, our regular seasons have normally been that we try to put a league schedule, which is really the games that matter as far as um, uh, qualifying for postseason. We've tried to maximize the amount of games that we've given schools. Well, in this particular case, we've got to almost look at this completely differently now um, and, and figure out ways to be creative um, and to keep kids maybe closer to home. Um, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but there's some models out there. And again, we don't want to get too far down the road um, with it. But those are definitely things that we have to consider, especially if things continue to go into an uptick. Um, and we have to worry about contact tracing and all those things that we've got to minimize the amount of travel and, and um, the amount of contact between um, teams. And Mike, with this floating, um, you know, fourth season with, you know, the second part of fall sports there, Potentially, you could have sports like football and field hockey in the spring. It just allows for that kind of flexibility, correct? Uh, and then again, that's the most important thing for us is to be able to, to have a, uh, a plan where we don't have to blow it all up and start from scratch. I think we can, we can work within the framework that we're talking about right here and just make the best decisions we can as we move. Um, so, yeah. So, again, look, we, you know, if we can do um, uh, you know, uh, half the fall sports, in the fall, we've still got a, a spot for those other those other things. But the reality is, we're still going to have some really difficult decisions as we go, um, because you know there there are concerns with uh, indoor sports at this point. And and if we don't get out of phase three, or we don't start to get to a position where um, things are changing much, then then those sports could be impacted too. And that's just the reality of the situation. But I think this gives us the best chance um, to get every sport in. Hey, Mike, uh, so much for easing into your position as the executive director. Uh, I know that you've been involved in school athletics for a long time and been at the Interscholastic League for a long time, but is there anything that could have prepared you for what you faced during your first month as executive director? No, and, and you know what? We had a, um, it's interesting, we had an orientation with the National Federation for, all, for the new executive directors. And uh, so um, um, the, the executive director in Delaware, the executive director in Indiana, and myself, are, are the new people coming in. And, and during that uh, conversation, the new president is uh, 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 Kerwin Erhan from um, Missouri. And his first message to us was that, um, don't worry, you're not any further along than any other executive director in the country at this point, because none of us have been through a worldwide pandemic. And he said, but with that said, this year is gonna be like drinking water out of a fire hose. 
And I think that's the visual that, that I'm going with uh, as we head into this. But, you know, but again, listen, I mean, our mission is to provide opportunities for kids. And that's what we're going to do. Um, and we're going to work with our schools. We're going to work with all of our stakeholders. And we're going to do the best job that we can um, to do that. But it, but it is comforting to know when we get on our calls with the other, other states across the country um, that we're all going through the same thing. So, um, you know, it's been, it's been difficult. Um, but on the other side of it, uh, we're hoping things are going to get better as the year goes on. Mike, with this second fall season, um, talking to some coaches, it's, it seems their concern is that, you know, some of these schools don't have the resources to practice outdoors in March when the weather's kind of iffy and field hockey and soccer clearly aren't something that can be done when there's snow out there. So what, is there a, a, a broad timing of when this would take place or is it, are we just kind of full? Yeah. Just trying to fit I, I mean, I wish, I mean, Eric, I wish, I wish we could give you certainty. I really do. Um, but again, you know, if we start throwing dates out there, then, then again, we don't want to speculate and then have to change things. Um, I, we, listen, we understand that those are issues that we're going to have to deal with if that happens. But I think the only other alternative is that we're going to have to cancel sports. Um, so, you know, again, I think that, that we're going to work within this framework and we're going to do the best job that we can um, and try to avoid that if, if, if at all possible. And then just for, just for clarity with the football, those sport, the second fall sports, are they going to, they're not going to be allowed to practice once we hit that September 14th date, correct? Or the August 1st date, right? Or 31st. That's uncertain at this point. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Mike, can we expect to get an update, you know, whether it's the 18th, 19th, 20th, once schools have their, you know, firm set schedule then and you guys make your decision and can we kind of reconvene and do this again? Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's our that's our plan. And again, you know, I think once we once we know that, I think that also gives us a little more time to work with the governor's office on the on the sport rules modifications that we have in place um, to hopefully see if we can um, uh, figure out if we're moving beyond those phase three guidelines. But I, I think one thing that the governor mentioned back in, in the early part of July when, when she announced um, youth sports guidance, um, that school sports guidance was going to come out later in the summer. So, you know, we're working on that timeline. But again, you know, we can't get out ahead of what schools are doing. So once, once we know that, um, hopefully we're going to be able to have a, a little more certainty until then. And until that point, I mean, is there really anything you and your staff can do or is it just really just the wait and see game? Well, I think one, one of the things that we can do is we can plan for um, fall sports um, because we don't know which ones we're going to be able to offer. So I think that's what we're going to do for, from a pre-planning standpoint is work with our schools and our athletic directors to, to put those plans in place. And if we get the green light, go ahead with them, then we're ready to go. Um, so again, at this point, between now and the end of August, that contact with uh, our coaches and kids can still happen. Um, and, and that's needed because obviously these kids have been shut in for such a long time that I, I want to emphasize that, that uh, what, what a great job many of our coaches did. Uh, even when they couldn't meet with kids, uh, they were doing things virtually with them. They were staying connected with them um, and, uh, and keeping them motivated. So um, I think that, that you, know, even though, you know, even though there's a potential that some of those fall sports may not go, just the, the contact that they have is healthy for them. So it's getting them connected um, to, to school, which is important. It's getting them uh, connected to education, um, and, and it's keeping them a little bit more physically fit. So, so we're hoping, you know, we're hoping for the best and, and, uh, and, and planning, planning for every scenario.